Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to another edition of You and Me and Multiple Sclerosis. My name is Pam, and I've been dealing with multiple sclerosis for almost 37 years. I'm not a medical professional of any kind, but I have become quite an expert on my own MS, and I invite all of you to do the same. And in the meantime, I want to share with you some of the things that I've learned and experienced in my 37 years with multiple sclerosis. Can't go on without my tea, right? <laughs> so today I'm going to have peppermint vanilla tea in my Laurel Birch cat mug. So yeah, now that I have taken care of that important thing, let me move along to what I'm going to talk about today. Sometime earlier, I had posted a video about Dr. Roy Swank who for me has been kind of the foundational neurologist when it comes to how to look at multiple sclerosis as something that's affecting the body and that you have more control over certain aspects of that than you might think. We are in a world where the solution for everything comes in a pill or a shot. I'm not going to say that those things don't have their place. They certainly do. But we all want to be able to change something about how we're going on with our lives to make things better, to keep ourselves from feeling unnecessarily worse. And I credit Dr. Swink with helping me in the early years of my MS with taking some control over my life and how it was going. And I think it did really help my MS. There's no way to know because you can't be the control of your own experiment. But, there's, but I do believe that I am better today because I was given a copy of Dr. Swank's book early on in my MS life and that I did follow his guidance for a number of years. I was also privileged to be his patient for several years in the mid-2000s while he still had his clinic in Portland, Oregon. For quite some time, he was the chair of the neurology department at Oregon Health and Science University, which to this day is my place to go for not just neurology, but oncology and any number of things because they're pretty fantastic down there. But he was their department chair for neurology for 20 years from 1954 to 1974. Although his research on diet and multiple sclerosis actually spanned far longer than that. It started in 1949 and went all the way to his death. The story goes that when he had enlisted in World War II, when he was fighting over in Europe, he saw that there was a mysterious decline in the number of folks suffering with chronic illnesses like heart disease, like multiple sclerosis. And he searched for a reason for why that might be. Well, he figured out that what was going on was that with all of the shortages and the rationing of things like meat and dairy, people had to change the way that they were eating. And it may have been those very changes in diet that accounted for their better health. So he decided when he came back from the war that he was going to study that more carefully to see if that were really true. So in 1949, he was in Montreal at the time. He began a decades long investigation into whether diet, particularly a low fat diet, would help with multiple sclerosis. Here is a photo of Dr. Swink, around the age when I knew him. And on the right is the current edition of his Multiple Sclerosis Diet Book. The book that my friend gave me was actually an earlier edition, and the, some of the recipes may have been different, but the basic text was the same. His diet principles and the conclusions that he drew. Unless you think that he was just a nutritionist that, you know, happened to have a neurology degree. Here's the start of the Immemorium article that was published in the highly respected journal Neurology when Dr. Swank passed away. 
And I'll just read this, and you'll get an idea of the breadth of his scientific expertise. Dr. Roy Laverswank, first head of neurology at what is now Oregon Health and Science University, died November 16, 2008, in Portland at age 99. Dr. Swank was best known for his advocacy of a low-fat diet for multiple sclerosis, but his career encompassed much more. Between 1934 and 2003, he published over 170 scholarly works. His varied research included studies on a stain for myelin undergoing degeneration, the Swank Davenport stain, thiamine deficiency, chronic combat exhaustion, prevention of microemboli following cardiac bypass surgery, effects of fat on blood viscosity, and diet in the treatment of MS. Yeah, that's a pretty impressive set of investigative endeavors, wouldn't you say? Well, here is the list of dietary guidelines that Dr. Swank promoted in his book, and certainly in his clinic, these were the kinds of things that he was telling us that we needed to do. First and perhaps most important, no processed foods containing saturated fat and or hydrogenated oils. So as we know, saturated fat is predominantly found in animal-based foods. There are a couple of plant foods, notably the avocado and nuts, would have some saturated fat. But the vast majority of saturated fat in the American diet will come from animal fat and also hydrogenated oils, which at least in the United States have been pretty much taken away from foods that are available to us now. No naturally occurring food is going to have hydrogenated oil in it because by its very nature, hydrogenated means that something has been done to it in processing. Second, saturated fat should not exceed 15 grams per day. So you can have a few nuts. You can do a piece of avocado, but you really need to be careful how many grams of saturated fat you ingest per day. An unsaturated fat, which is oils, which are vegetable-based, should be kept 20 to 30 grams per day. So even though those are from plants and therefore more healthy for you, and his understanding was that you do need some oil in your diet, he, did, he wanted you to restrict that. Next, fruits and vegetables are permissible in any amount, and not every diet says that, but he wasn't making a distinction between vegetables that perhaps were more starchy or fruits that were perhaps more high in fructose. He didn't care. He just said, you can have whatever you want. No red meat for the first year, including pork. And then after the first year, you could have three ounces of red meat allowed once per week. And that was early on. I think what you'll see in diets since then is that the plant-based diets basically frown on having any meat at all. And the second one is similar, white meat poultry, as long as it's skinless, and white fish are permissible but you need to avoid dark meat poultry and limit fatty fish to 50 grams per day. So even though it's restricted, there's a lot more of that allowed. So you can have your salmon if you want, which is a good thing because I love salmon. The next one is dairy products. Must contain 1% or less butter fat unless otherwise noted. Use egg whites only and no yolks. So he was okay with dairy as long as it was low-fat dairy. And then cod liver oil. He wanted you to take a teaspoon of that, either in a capsule or just a spoonful. And a multivitamin, a mineral supplement, are recommended every day. And then the next one, whole grain breads, rice, and pastas are encouraged. Now, I suppose by that he means, you know, not really limited. As long as they're whole grain, and notice that, that even then he was talking about whole grain, not the processed stuff that a lot of us have relied on in most of our lives. And then finally, daily snacks of nuts and seeds are good sources of natural oil, and they help maintain a good energy level.
So he was a fan of having nuts for sure, even though they did have some saturated fat in them. Well, I followed this diet for a number of years, but Dr. Swank had to close his clinic because he spent more time with each patient than the insurance companies were willing to pay for. That was the last I saw of him, but he continued his research for the next few years until he passed away. But does that mean that he is gone and forgotten? No. And in today's video, I want to talk a little bit about his legacy and two medical professionals who are keeping it alive. The first person I want to talk about a little bit is John McDougall, who is a medical doctor. He describes himself as a family doctor. So he's not a specialist the way many folks are in the, in the MS field. He got to know Dr. Swank and he became friends with him. He used to sit and talk with him about the diet and the principles behind it. And after Dr. Swank passed away, Dr. McDougall decided that he should not allow the legacy of Dr. Swank to just fade away and disappear. I've noted here a video that is up and available to us on YouTube, and I would highly encourage you to watch it because this is John McDougall talking about the impact of diet, and it's all based on Dr. Swank's work and what Dr. McDougall has done with that in years that followed on. I pulled just a couple of the stills from this because I don't want to violate anybody's copyright. But you can see right here, he titles this one slide, My Hero, Roy Swank, MD. I can read you the quote that he has pulled here. In 1959, Dr. Swank wrote, Gluttony and chronic degenerative diseases have been linked in the minds of both laymen and scientists for many years. The saying, to dig your grave with your teeth, probably has its origin in antiquity. But in the prosperous areas of the Western world during the past few decades, the maxim has taken on real and tragic meaning. That was from a publication of Dr. Swink's from years ago, Reasons, Rules, and Recipes for the Low-Fat Diet that he was promoting. Dr. McDougall approached Oregon Health and Science University to participate in a study that he wanted to conduct one of the criticisms that the medical profession had been leveling at Dr. Swank's body of work on MS and diet was that it was not a controlled experiment. You know the gold standard. You have to have a placebo-controlled study in order for the results to be valid. Well, first of all, there was no such thing as randomized placebo-controlled trials back when Dr. Swank started his work in 1949. But even so, it would not have been ethical as far as Dr. Swank was concerned to deprive various folks of the diet in order to create a control group, right? If he really believed in his work, he certainly wanted everybody to have access to it. It gave his critics grounds for dismissing his work. So what Dr. McDougall decided to do was to approach OHSU and ask them to participate with him in developing an actual controlled experiment that would pass muster with the folks that really thought that that was essential to any kind of dietary intervention. So here you can see on the slide, it was randomized and controlled and blinded. And blind means that the investigators don't know who was on the diet and who wasn't. It began in January of 2009 and it ended in March of 2013. Well, what were some of the results? This article was put out on his site on July 31st, 2014, so about a year after the study was over. And the title is Results of the Diet and Multiple Sclerosis Study. And I'll just read a little bit of this to you. On Tuesday, January 16, 2008, the McDougall program made first contact with the Department of Neurology at Oregon Health and Science University, the medical school in Portland, Oregon, with a proposal to study the effects of a very low-fat diet on multiple sclerosis. OHSU was chosen because of Roy Swank, MD, head of the Division of Neurology at OHSU, 
From 1954 to 1974, Dr. Swank was the founder of the low-fat dietary approach to MS. He was also my friend and one of my mentors. And as he says here at the, near the end, in an effort to support Dr. Swank's observational research, we took on the task of doing a study that fellow scientists might respect, a single-blind randomized controlled trial of one year's duration. On January 15, 2009, we received approval from the Ethics Board of OHSU to conduct this study. Those in the intervention group were sent to the McDougall program in Santa Rosa, California for a 10-day education and then asked to follow the diet for a year. The raters, who were neurologists, radiologists, and other analysts, were blinded as to which patients were in the intervention diet group and which were in the control group, staying on the Western diet. Over the next four years, 61 people were enrolled in the study. Most of the results have now been released and will soon be published in medical journals. And he talks about how there was a high compliance rate, which is, of course lends a lot of validity to the results. The conventional wisdom is that people won't follow a diet rigidly enough for an experiment to be successful. But as you can see here, the numbers are quite impressive. He says here, too, that the, the folks on the diet not only lost weight, but they lowered their bad cholesterol, which is the cause of another chronic illness that many people in our modern world become victims to. The bottom line was that there was a strong correlation discovered between just general better health for those with multiple sclerosis and following the diet that Dr. Swank had promoted for so many years. And as we can see here, follow-up studies continue to be done, and one that was published in 2014 showed that that same study gave us evidence that low-fat diet helps fatigue in people with MS. That, of course, is very important because almost everyone with MS reports that at some point or other they've really dealt with fatigue. Now, another person that I would like to talk about a little bit is Dr. George Jelinek. And the program that he has developed is called Overcoming Multiple Sclerosis. He is not from America. He's from Australia. Dr. Swank's work is not limited just to the United States. Well, this is Dr. Jelinek's book, Overcoming Multiple Sclerosis. And the nutritionist has published a cookbook, and he's written the forward for it. One of the things about having multiple sclerosis is that we really don't have a lot of energy for fussy recipes, and there are quite a range in here. So even I, with my limited energy and patience, can manage to put together some of these. I want to read a few pieces of the timeline that he has here on his website, and I'll put the link to that below. So under 1999, it says that Professor George Jelinek, a medical doctor, is diagnosed with MS at age 45. 18 years prior to his diagnosis, his mother took her own life at the age of 45, having been totally incapacitated by a progressive form of MS. So that is his motivation. And I would say that makes him one of the few medical doctors dealing with MS who's actually got MS. And then his second bullet here, within weeks of diagnosis, Professor Jelinek researched over a thousand key research papers drawn from the top 5,000 of the world's leading medical journals. And notice here, he says, including Roy Swank's work. Swank is the only person he mentions by name in this little summary. It becomes clear to Jelinek that remaining well after an MS diagnosis was a real possibility with a commitment to the right lifestyle changes. He creates the Overcoming MS program, including recommendations for lifestyle and dietary changes. He has modified Swank's diet guidelines somewhat. The key elements of the Overcoming Multiple Sclerosis program are a diet very low in saturated fats, and he says plant-based with seafood. So seafood is fine. Other plant-based diets do not want us eating seafood at all, but he sees seafood as a way to get the oils that are very important to us. As he says here, omega-3s, you can supplement with that, certainly, if you don't get enough fish or you don't like fish or you have a fish allergy. 
regular exercise, stress management, including daily meditation, vitamin D through sunlight and supplementation. And medication may also be required as recommended by an individual's neurologist, but not in all cases. So he's not convinced that everyone needs to be on medication, at least at the time in that, back, back in those days. And I will say that the medications that were available to us during these years were not all that effective. I think history has shown that. The diet did every bit as well, if not much, much better than most of the medications or any of the medications that were available to us back then. And now I just want to play a, sh a short clip from a YouTube video that you can go out and see. I'll put the link down below for the full thing. But I just wanted you to know how highly Dr. Jelinek thinks of Dr. Swink as he begins right here, kind of in mid-sentence. So about 30 seconds is all I'm going to play. And of course, when he started his study, this big study I found in The Lancet over 34 years, that was 1949 and randomised control trials didn't exist. And I think, in fact, if he'd been publishing his study in 1949 instead of in 1990, I mean, he needed to take the 34 years to do the study and then write it up and so on. If he'd published it back in 49, I think he would have won the Nobel Prize in Medicine. Well, I guess I want to agree with that. <laughs> Dr. Swain deserved getting the Nobel Prize. Being on that kind of a diet, I believe, has helped me. I am in secondary progressive, and as you know, I'm not the way I was 20, 30 years ago, but I think I'm far ahead of where I might have been. I have not been perfectly following the diet, but I have modified it maybe a little bit more in line with what Dr. Jelinek is proposing. I love seafood and we do eat quite a bit of that. I'm really not interested in eating much other meat. And I really do try to cut back on processed foods, particularly sugar and refined flour, because I believe that the more we eat whole grains, the better we will be. Our digestive system and certainly our brain will appreciate that we aren't eating all that refined powdery stuff that as far as the brain is concerned, you might as well be inhaling some kind of drug because it hits your brain like a, a tidal wave. So that's basically it. I just really wanted to follow up with my video on Dr. Swank that I made, oh, quite some time ago because if I left the impression that his work has been lost to history and swallowed up in all of the medical advances that we've made since then, I did not mean to leave that impression. I do believe that diet plays a critical role in multiple sclerosis just as it does in anything else in life. So I would invite all of you to investigate one or more of these various dietitians, nutritionists, medical professionals what they have to say about diet and what they back it up with, what kinds of studies, what kinds of research they've done, and why they promote the things that they do and why they tell us to restrict what they do. I think it repays study. And one thing I know about people with MS, they're really good at researching and studying stuff. So go for it. And if you have any comments, if you follow a certain diet and it's worked for you, not worked for you, I would love to know more about that. So leave a comment, let me know. But I'm going to get back to drinking my tea. So until next time, take care. <laughs>